Hey there folks, so welcome to Spectrum Pulse. We talk about music, movies, art, and culture. And today we're gonna to be talking about the sophomore album from Always called Anti-Socialites. So I'm not sure that anybody was expecting Always' self-titled debut album to blow up the way it did. And that includes the band themselves. Now granted, there's some context required for this. It was a critically well-received record. Some of this was inevitably skewed by them being a Canadian band, and we tend to over-promote Canadian acts. And they did have a crossover single in Marry Me Archie. But considering I wouldn't even describe that as one of the better songs from that album in 2014, it's still a little bit amazing to me that an act that I picked up on a whim from Pitchfork in the summer doldrums turned out to be one of the most textured and layered and yet ridiculously tight indie acts to break out of the 2010s. And I'm not kidding about that either. Amazingly sharp melodic hooks, writing that was emotionally balanced and yet colorful and witty enough to back up its storytelling, and a wonderfully expressive and engaging front woman in Molly Rankin. It led to that debut making my year and list of the best albums of 2014. And if anything, it's only gotten better in my eyes. The song craft is held up there. Now all that being said, there was some pause for concern surrounding their upcoming sophomore record, Anti-Socialites, mostly as Buzz was suggesting it was pivoting in more of a dream pop direction. Now, there were a lot of hints of this on their debut, but I was never really a fan of the band's choice of synthesizers, and if they chose to neglect some of the tighter, more guitar-driven melodic grooves, this could lead to a serious misstep going in, and the inclusion of John Congleton on production didn't exactly raise my spirits. I mean, he's a smart enough producer to get out of the way when necessary, but I wasn't sure how the shift from Chad Van Galen would connect in terms of capturing a lot of that deeper atmosphere. Now all that being said, it's not like that Temple suffered by a pop-leaning pivot on their second record three years after their first, and that happened between 2014 and 2017, a lot like Always here, so okay, maybe they would manage to stick the landing? Well, okay, here's the thing. I know I've got a really bad habit of following up debuts that I cover on this show by nitpicking the hell out of their follow-ups if they don't measure up, and I I'm gonna try and avoid some of that here, especially as, just like their self-titled first album, I think this is pretty damn great. I don't quite think it's better than that first record, but I suspect some of that comes down to my own personal artistic preferences rather than always screwing up as an act, because this certainly is a more diverse, colorful, and refined album, showcasing the song craft that makes this really easy to like. It just might not always be to my personal taste. And I do want to stress this, if you're coming off of Alves' debut record to this, a lot of what drew you in here, it does remain. The guitars are fuzzy with a lot of sharp melodic interplay, the drums are punchy, and when they do creep in the drum machines, they're tastefully blurred in. One benefit of playing on the edges of lo-fi like this does is that said edges can be kind of smoothed over, and the hooks are as sticky as ever, carried on Molly Rankin's expressive voice that comes through cleaner than ever before. Hell, if we're looking at areas where I think this record plays even more so to its strengths, not to mention being more accessible, I would say it comes in a lot of the vocals and the synth production, where Rankin's wry blend of weary sarcasm and genuine emotion is always very clean and clear. More to the front of the mix than ever before, she's not being drowned out, and many of the synth tones are blended just as carefully. Sure, you get moments that feel a little bit atonal, like on the opening in Undertow, a song that might drown itself in its own haze of feedback a little bit too much, but really think about it, is that any different than the jagged pileup of riffs that we got on Your Type, or the interplay on Saved by a Waif? Well, in the latter case, I really do love love how full and rich that synthesizer tone can pick up. It feels more organic, which actually fits the cleaner feel of the song. You know what, that actually did throw me off a little bit. How the fidelity of tones, especially in some of the vocals, can shift ever so slightly on tracks, like the cleaner, early 80s, post-punk inspired tones on Hey. But for the most part, the synth tones, they blend effectively, and we get the ramshackle, lo-fi melancholy of the closing track, Forget About Life, or the gorgeous interweaving guitar lines on Not My Baby, or just the smoky, fast fast-paced balance of lollipop ode to Jim and plimsoil punks that picks up plenty of buzzy groove on the low end. Now granted, if I'm being bluntly honest, I do wish that the bass lines came through with a little bit more prominent texture like they did on that debut album. They can almost feel a little bit underwhelming in comparison, or when they're not center stage, like on Dreams Tonight or Hey or Say By Away. And as good as the melodies are, I just wish the groove had a little bit more fullness in order to back up all that really significant atmosphere. But then again, Again, 
that's nitpicking around some otherwise really great tones and really great hooks. And well, of course, none of this is reinventing the wheel when it comes to Dream Pop or Jangle Pop. Solid melodic progressions, well-timed arpeggiated solos, and real texture means I'm already going to be drawn to this material. I like this. So let's talk content. Now, one of the reasons why the self-titled debut had so much power with me is that it was taking a very millennial approach to the formation of new relationships and was doing it smartly. Self-aware and self-deprecating by necessity, but also willing to take the piss out of social constructs that were then embraced without a full understanding of all the consequences down the road. Hell, the power of that album came from Rankin being so powerfully embodying that character and all the cracks seeping through the veneer of self-preservation. Well, if all these was the album where the relationships were forming, Anti-Socialites lives up to his name in watching everything just fall apart. Less of a narrative-driven breakup album than a series of vignettes, basically watching human interaction in a tailspin, most of the record is seeing that other symptoms of my generation leap up to the forefront to render many of these relationships pretty damn toxic. Hipster detachment becomes dismissive with no turning back on In Undertale. Plim Soil Punks takes impressive optimism that often and characterizes millennials and shows how suffocating it can be while you're in its shadow. And your type shows immature recklessness, making the breakup almost inevitable when you just can't stomach it anymore. But where things get truly interesting comes in a lot of the framing of these songs. Because you can tell that the songwriting duo of Rankin and O'Hanley, they're not letting their narrator off the hook here. Because Hay shows her just being just as drunk and reckless. And Lollipop Ode to Jim shows her sucked back into a similar situation that she's broken up with in the past. This time with Jim read of the Jesus and Mary chain and highlighting how her attraction to this type shows to even span generations. Hell, Saved by a Wave is another hungover revival song that shows just how our protagonist could choose to become that manic pixie dream girl to quote Nathan Raven and yet another unstable relationship if only to avoid responsibilities lingering just out of the frame. It draws a nice comparison to Lydia Lovelace's superb record from last year called Real, where you can tell that she's looking for someone to make it seem real for her, something that's genuine and earnest and rewarding of all that, but Rankin conveys most of this through subtext in her delivery, not quite having reached the bluntness and world weariness that made real cut so deeply for me. But at the same time, it also makes the yearning of dreams tonight and the conflicted yet wistful feelings of not my baby in the post-breakup situation have real resonance. And by recentering the album beneath the overbuilt and often badly constructed condos of downtown Toronto, drunk on cheap wine to boot, it creates the moment where millennial loneliness was about to become the default personality for her, except she didn't unplug her phone opening up that lifeline to invite somebody in one more time, letting them forget about life together, because we're all in this together. And what I really appreciate about this record is that that subtext is so fully defined for her. The maturity is there between the lines. She's entirely aware of everything she's doing, now with the consequences even more sharply in frame. But that lonely earnestness, it rings through all the same. She's gonna keep trying. And that does have real emotive power for me. Now again, I think for me personally, I'm not crazy about the vignette yet style storytelling. I think I prefer the loose but overall more direct arc of their debut. And I do think Already Gone can feel a little bit too abstract and listless to mesh well with the rest of the writing on the album. But you know what, here's the funny thing. The more I have thought about this record, and the more that I've processed and thought over all those thoughts, the more that I like this album, the more I respect it. I'm still not quite sure it's got quite the same electric cuts that I love so much about that debut. I'm not sure there's any quite equal to a top of cake. But oh man, with a lot of these melodies, it really does get damn damn close. And thus for me, I'm thinking a light 8 out of 10, certainly a recommendation. If you're a fan of jangling, retro-leaning indie and dream pop that is refreshingly modern in a lot of its content, I think you're going to dig this out a lot. Definitely worth your time. Check it out. It's worth it. So yeah, thanks a lot for watching. Like to like and subscribe, I'd be more than grateful. Seriously, guys, you want to check this out, not just because I'm supporting another Canadian act. It's some great dream jangle pop. It's a lot of fun. Link to buy is it in the description below. And I got the poll up there. So I'm curious where you guys think this falls in comparison with their debut. Beyond that, anything else I might be able to do to improve my presentation, I'm all ears. And if you guys want to get involved with my scheduling process and support this channel, link to my Patreon is right over there, where three times a week you guys get to vote on my schedule, and once a week for the higher tier contributors, you get to add albums, movies, or even year-end or potentially top 10 list to that schedule. More details is right there. You're going to want to check out that top tier. It's new. But until then, I'm Mark. You're watching Spectrum Pulse. And I'll see you next time.